a gentleman pulled up next to me, instead of standing up to do a number one like I was, decided to about face 180 degrees, drop his dax and take a squat position <laughs> two feet next to me and do his number two into the same trough where I was doing number one. Welcome to episode number two of our brand new travel podcast. Number, oh, how appropriate. Episode number two. <laughs> episode number two. Uh, toilets. Toilets. That's a good point, Pete. Yeah. We'll use that. So today we're going to be talking all about the weird, the wonderful, the best and the worst of international toilets whilst you're traveling. We've got a few stories to tell and ideas to discuss. We're going to start with the best. Yeah. And like shit does, work our way downhill. <laughs> We're going to first recognize that uh, what we call toilets come under different names around the world. What we call toilets, some people might refer to as the WC, the wash closet, or the wash room, the bathroom, or the restroom. That's what we're talking about today. But for us Aussies, we call them toilets. Or the dunny. Or the shitter. <laughs> or the outhouse. Or the... The hot box. The thunder box. The thunder box, that's it. Not the hot box, you idiot. The thunder box. <laughs> so, Pete, tell me, do yeah. you have any recollections of your best toilet experiences that you found on your travels? The best toilet experiences for me have been not necessarily the actual toilet, but the more the surrounding environment of the toilet. I'm thinking about when I was in Malawi on an island called Lakoma, and... Um, this place where I was staying had uh, had a couple of toilets and they actually had this door system where you could close the door but you could open the top half so you could see out but obviously everybody couldn't see in at you doing your business because that's creepy. So you could just sit in there and chill and you had a great view of Lake Malawi. It was, it was, quite, uh, it was quite pleasant. That the serenity fun. was awesome. <laughs> How's the serenity? How's the serenity? It was great. Sounds like a kind of like a door for a horse in a horse yeah, shed or a horse stable. That's exactly the way to explain it. Where the it. bottom half stays closed. Yeah, you could keep half. the bottom half shut so you obviously you couldn't see what was going on downstairs. But uh, <laughs> while you were sitting there, you didn't have to you didn't have to stare at a door. You could stare at Lake Malawi. It was fantastic. So a, a loo with a view. It was a loo, it was a poo with a view. A poo with a view. Yeah. Have you had any other good poos with a view? Um, I did have another good one in Tiger Leaping Gorge in China. Tell Similar. us about that one. Tiger Leaping Gorge is a is a couple of day hike through the mountains in China, and uh, it's one of the stops along the way there was there was like a downstairs toilet that you went to, kind of toilet washroom area, and um, basically the the toilets were they were in like the side of the cliff, and they just you went in you went in one way, and they just opened out onto a gorge, Tiger Leaping Gorge at that. So another um, great poo with a view. Another great poo with a view, really, yeah. Again, not the the actual toilet themselves wasn't that nice, but the the view really made up for the for the lack of toilet quality, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I would concur. I have done Tiger Living Gorge, the two day hike yeah. in China, and uh, did enjoy the facilities. Yeah. Okay. In particular, the view. The Enjoyed view. them especially for the view. The view is the, the best bit. I remember there was these uh, hostels and accommodation spots and restaurant spots, which all had restroom toilet facilities, and they were all built right into the side of the cliff face looking down over the gorge with those amazing views. And there were just two walls and then a door and then one completely open wall, uh, non-existing wall that would open up to the to the gorge to the view yeah it exactly. was pretty special it was really i remember really on the hike that each each other sort of rest stop or guest house one of their biggest advertising pitches <laughs> to passing by travelers was that they had the best view the toilet with the best yeah view. that's true that actually. was their sales point yeah i, I remember, remember. Yeah. yeah that's right they never really advertised the comfiest beds no. or any air conditioning or that because none of that really existed they didn't really advertise the food quality or anything that it was always toilets with a view for me, uh, some of the best toilets that I can remember thinking about the toilets themselves, the actual facilities, it would be a split decision between either uh, Germany or Japan. 
Uh, and if I was forced to choose, I'd probably say Japan wins out. I've heard a lot about Japanese toilets. I've never been to Japan myself, so I've not experienced them, but uh, I've heard rave reviews. They have a great reputation and they for do. good reason. Mm. I've visited Japan a couple of times and lived there myself for about six months during a winter ski season. And the toilets there are next level. They're hard <laughs> to believe. I mean, where do you start? For anyone who's been to Japan, they know how good the toilets are. And they're in a league of their own to the point that when you first go to a proper good Japanese toilet, you almost feel in another world. It's space age like the technology around the toilet is stuff that you've never seen before and you don't actually quite know what to do. You don't even know what all the bits and pieces are meant to do and how to actually even behave or which button to press when you're in there. It can be quite overwhelming and, and confusing at first. So to begin with, Japanese seats generally are padded. They have padded toilet seats. Amazing. The it's simple so simple, things, right? so simple. Yeah, yeah. But they go next level with their toilets, so padded seats. And that's just the beginning. A lot of the time you'll find that the toilet seat is heated. Again, that's incredible. Heated, padded seats we're talking. And then when you pay a bit more for your toilet, and we're talking mostly toilets in-house, so in people's homes, not necessarily public toilets, but uh, in-house toilets, uh, you have an armrest. Great addition. <laughs> Who doesn't want an armrest? No, well, for those long sessions. You for know. those long sessions when number two is not quite cooperating <laughs> and you need to rest an arm, you have an armrest. Yep. And on the end of the armrest, it almost feels like you're in a seat in an aeroplane where on your armrest you have a bunch of dials and gadgets and settings and selections and a little panel that's giving you numbers and readings and all sorts of stuff. So it's very high tech. So on your armrest – you have a number of settings, uh, being the temperature of your seat, uh, deluxe ones. You can choose music. Music. Music, anything from waterfalls to nice calming wind sounds to ocean sounds. You to can like get really relax you into the, into the mood. To create a very relaxed and flowing, carefree environment. <laughs> flowing. Two of my favorites are probably the dolphin soundtrack what? and or the whale soundtrack. Yep, nothing Is more relaxing. Is really relaxing though? Like- well, it, it was uh, relaxing. It was a mix of maybe ocean and dolphin perhaps. Okay. But uh, the whale soundtrack, very relaxing. That sounds quite calming. Almost almost sleep-inducing, Yeah, I would say, um, <laughs> which is an extreme relaxed state. <laughs> But perhaps to the point of uh, maybe a safety concern, falling asleep on the toilet is not something you want to do all the time. Especially if you're at work. It's got to be like... A good way to pass the time at work, I guess, if you're falling asleep on the toilet. Your boss might not like it so much, but... No. Well, <laughs> I guess if people abuse it, then yeah, they true. take the whale soundtrack out uh, yeah, shit. and you get Jack Ruin Hammer soundtrack <laughs> to get off there quickly. Yeah, chainsaw soundtrack. But then probably the most notable thing about a Japanese toilet as if there's not enough already, is that they have, uh, let's say, a, a water chute uh, designed for uh, the post-job cleaning. Mm-hmm. And they have two types. The blue button is for cleaning of the number two area uh, to be used by everybody. And they also have an additional button <laughs> a pink button (laughs) and that is for the females for cleaning of female number one areas right so you have two different water spouts one blue one pink surely if they've if they've done the if they've done the one pink they should have done the other button brown not you blue. would think brown would be more appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Because the fact that one is pink for girls kind of maybe makes sense in a traditional gender sort of color scheme way. But the blue suggests maybe boys only, but oh, that's really for everybody. Yeah. So blue is misleading. And yeah, the blue really has nothing to do with it other than the fact that maybe it's water and we associate blue with water. Because much as they don't like to admit it, girls poo. I've I've heard that I've heard uh, rumors yeah. that I yeah. mean I've always been told uh, rainbows yeah. uh, at most, but I believe that uh, they actually do. I think they and do. And so maybe the fact that it's painted blue, it's code to uh, make guys think that it's uh, only for guys, but girls know. So maybe a woman designed this toilet. Maybe 
to and hide she's, and yeah. she's keeping up the stereotype. She's keeping up the secret. Keeping the secret up. Yeah. And maybe the blue is to mislead guys thinking that, well, blue is just for guys. Just for blokes. that would never be used for girls. And maybe. the pink one's just for girls. Interesting. So, yeah. you have these water shoots, these water fountains um, for the cleaning, uh, which a lot of people find very weird at first, but it makes sense. Uh, the water's often warm. So you get a warm clean. You wouldn't want cold, would you? That'd be cold's not quite shocking. Yes, especially in the middle of winter or something. So you get a good warm clean, and then in addition to that, because people find it weird because like, okay, we have water on my bum, right? Okay, Um, but then now I'm wet, and you're like, well, do I use toilet paper then to like sort of clean up the last the last bit of clean is with paper and maybe the dry off? But no, eco friendly. Don't waste paper. There is a heater that turns on. Really? You get hot blown air <laughs> blown onto you to to dry after the wetting cleaning process. Amazing. It's yeah. I mean, the first time you use it, it's uh, life changing. I bet it is. Yeah. There's there's some parts in life where there's like a pre life, and then something significant happens, and then there's a post life. <laughs> and for everybody, there's a pre Japanese toilet life, and then yeah. there's a much better, like a utopia reaching nirvana post-Japanese <laughs> toilet life. And so for anyone who hasn't experienced it, who hasn't crossed to the other side, me, come and join us in the Garden of Eden. How after do you feel now, though? Now that you are away from it, you must do you miss it? I do miss it. Yeah, yeah I do miss it. And I long for it sometimes. It sounds fantastic. I don't um, doubt you do. Yeah, they're, they're pretty special. <laughs> So not only do you get the water clean mm. and then you get the hot air dry, some, if you're going really deluxe. Don't tell me there's fragrance. You get a fragrance. <laughs> you get a perfume blow to make sure everything smells <laughs> rosy down there. That is you amazing. You get a fragrance wow. puff and you leave there. A, a Better than when you went in. A, yeah, a changed person. You leave I mean, there cleaner than when you went in. There's no need for, for showers or anything after that because oh. the most important bit is clean <laughs> and dry and fragrantly rosy <laughs> Smelling fresh. like roses, yeah. actually smelling like roses. Um, so the Japanese toilet experience is one to be had by all. So Sounds incredible. For no other reason. Than the toilets, go and visit Japan. Do yourself a favor, change your life. I'm sure there's other stuff to visit in Japan as well. But there's a few other things. One or two. One or two on the side, but mainly, mainly, mainly the toilets. The toilet experience yeah. is where it's at. And then I mentioned that the German toilets are pretty impressive as well. Mm. Now, in this case, I'm talking public toilets. Oh, yeah. I remember at uh, gas stations, fuel stations, roadside stops. Uh, you used to have to pay for the toilets. You'd pay anything between 50 euro cents, maybe 70 or 80 euro cents. You'd go through a turnstile to get into the washrooms. And the idea was to keep it sort of safe and like user friendly. So not just everybody was using it willy nilly and making a mess of the place. Kind of kept people honest by charging a small fee. But your entry fee, you would get back in a kind of discount coupon. You get a little ticket that said 50 euro cents on it or 80 euro cents on it. And you could claim that money back on a purchase. If you're buying a soft drink, a soda, or if you're buying like a candy or a lolly or a chocolate bar or something like that, you would take your toilet ticket for the 50 cents or the 80 cents and you would get that off of your purchase. Mm. So instead of paying two euros for a chocolate bar, you would pay a euro 20 and your 80 cents from the toilet would be your discount off your chocolate bar. So it was a good little system. They're good, mate. The Germans are smart. They're on it. As we know, the stereotype of Germans being good with engineering, being efficient, being clean and organized and on time. It, it, the whole system screams Germany. It does. (laughs) And in addition to this, in addition to knowing that when you stop at a roadside, stop for a bathroom, you're going to have a clean, honest, well-worked system. The thing that really catches you and freaks you out the most the first time you see it is that when you've finished on the toilet and you push the flush, not only does it flush the bowl, but the entire toilet seat goes on a little adventure and does a full 360 spin. Yeah. As a sanitary cleaning arm comes down with like a sanitary sort of sponge on the end of it, and it wipes the entire toilet seat clean as it does its 360 journey. Yeah. And then the little arm folds away again. And it's a great idea. Ingenious. It is. Makes sense. Makes sense. Not relatively complicated, no. but just took someone to think of it. 
And the first time you see it, you freak out because you don't know what's <laughs> happening. You've never seen a toilet seat start spinning before. <laughs> and then when you see the sedentary arm and you put it all together, you're like, wow, that really makes sense. It does. And you're happy that you've been on a relatively clean sanitary toilet. Yeah. And then you realize that the 50 or 80 cents is going to good use and you're getting that back when you go and buy something from the store anyway. Yeah. So it's a win-win. It is. Great, great toilets. Mm. So Japan for just the amazing technology and all the little extras that you get. Germany for the efficiency and the great idea, especially with those public toilets. And then, of course, some of those ones you mentioned in Africa and in China, not necessarily the toilets themselves, just but the for view. their location the and location the view, the, views. the vista that it offers you, they yeah. hit some of our top toilets from around the world. Definitely. So having ticked off the top end, let's start the sliding scale <laughs> downwards. The slippery slope. The slippery slope downwards. The mud slide. Into the middle to the weird and wonderful, to the weird and wonderful toilets that you've come across or know of around the world. One comes to mind in Europe again and in parts of Asia. Uh, the the simple standing pissoir. And it's really just a hole in the ground and there is no toilet bulbs, no seat, no upright. It's just simply uh, two uh, spots for your feet and a an hole and they were lying on good aim. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not such a big deal except that the first time you come across it, it takes confusing. you by surprise a bit. Yeah, you wonder what's going on. And yeah. Did I walk into the wrong spot here? Yeah. You look around for a while where actually is the toilet and the Definitely. toilet seat in the bowl and then you realize, nope, no, it's just the hole in the ground and just the two spots for my feet indicated. And, <laughs> and at first you think, well, which way do I face? Do I face <laughs> to the wall or do I face away? And, you know, what's the actual, what's the protocol here? Yeah. What am I supposed to be doing? What, what direction am I supposed to be facing? But you figure it out and uh, you realize that you got better aim than, than you thought mm. and it all goes mostly in. Not much on your shoes or your feet. And then you walk out of there with your first pissoir experience. experience. I uh, quite liked the – I thought they were quite strange when I came across them at first, but it's the – have you seen the outdoor like urinals for men? I came across – the first time I came across them was in Amsterdam. Aha, uh -huh, yes. I, um, do, I do remember them first myself experiencing the outdoor male urinals in Amsterdam and in yeah. Holland as well. Tell us more about those. Well, it's just like a – I don't know how to explain it. Obviously, it's it's just for men. Unfortunately, sorry, ladies. Um, but it's just like a sort of an outdoor trough, really, isn't it? The ones I came across, they were like they had like sort of four entrances, four four places you could go, as it were. And, but it was just like you walked in and and it just kind of covered your midsection, so so you everybody could see your head from like outside. But it's not very private. At it's all, not private it? at all. If you if you were if you were a bit of stage fright kind of person, then you'd have a rough time. But yeah, it just sort of covered your midsection, and you could just have a quick wee in the streets for free. They are very weird and wonderful. It's, that is the definition of weird and wonderful. Yeah, and we like you, to thank the Dutch. Yeah, great idea. And if you just see them, like. They don't really look like a toilet. Like I remember first seeing one and thinking, what is that? And going to investigate and then the smell of ammonia was overwhelming and I thought, oh, I know what this is. I think, yeah, the first time you see it, you don't even realise that it's an outdoor men's pissing trough. <laughs> yeah. Unless someone is at it, Currently using it. Currently using it, yeah, that's true. And then you realise that there's like, you know, three or four all standing sort of facing in towards each other. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the fact that it's just out in the middle of the street, <laughs> just in the pedestrian area. Yeah, it's, it's not even like in a corner, is it? It's, it's not hidden. There's no kind of the semi-sheltered walls. No. Kind of, it's in the middle, it's in the of, middle the street, of the street, just on a pedestrian walkway somewhere, uh, normally near a popular sort of bar and yeah. night out, you know, busy area where... Uh, a lot of people would be needing the toilet after uh, drinking sessions and going in and out of different pubs and clubs and that sort of thing. And rather than having people try to do the sneaky. All over buildings and in corners. and Pee in the corner, pee on the tree, yeah. pee into the canals. Yeah. They fall these, in afterwards. And fall in afterwards. <laughs> has happened yeah. many a time. Many a time. They've put in these, yeah, public urinals. It's a great idea. And they're kind of like a... a they're not a permanent structure. No. 
they're like a plastic molded. Yeah. And you can see that they clearly get taken away and emptied every couple of days or a yeah. couple of weeks, that they're not a fixed structure, that no, they're just no. put there for either weekends or during festivals or during the summer or, or or just left there all year round, but every occasionally get taken away to be hopefully you know, to hopefully to be uh to be emptied and maybe cleaned or maintained or whatever yeah and i think these are the more modern day version of a traditional one because i don't know if you came across it but in amsterdam there is a permanent one it had a urinal inside it that was just big enough for one person mm. and the idea was you walked in and it was kind of like a quick little maze, like a little loop, like a cylinder shape. Okay. So you'd walk in and do kind of like a 360 walking in and around kind of like, you know, like the shape of like a, a snail's shell, you know, that kind of a loop yeah, where yeah. it starts wider and then gets small into the middle. Yeah. So kind of like a maze where you'd walk around a loop and then end up at the middle of a maze. So it'd be like that, but just quick. You'd be in and around. It'd just be a quick left, left, left. Um, around this little loop and there'd be a trough in there big enough for one person yeah and so once you've done this little walk in this little loop maze walk in it would offer you enough protection and privacy so the metal of this loop walk in would be you know maybe shoulder chest high and then maybe knee high so it's still again very public you yeah. know people are literally walking past you on the pedestrian you area. can look you can look you can make eye contact you can make eye contact yeah. people can see your feet at the bottom <laughs> they can see your sort of shoulders up at the top your suspicious hands <laughs> and yeah, your your arms are in that <laughs> obvious you're position. in that position <laughs> your face is maybe pulling that look <laughs> yeah. that relieving look really and you've funny. got people walking by <laughs> two three feet away from you on the pedestrian walk and it is the most bizarre it is thing, quite bizarre but it's a permanent structure and i'm guessing the trough is drained into the Hopefully general plumbed. city yeah. drainage sewage system and yeah. it's the most bizarre thing and the first time you come across it you think what and you're hesitant to use it but of course when you got to go you got to go and eventually you come to love it i i yeah i know i know the ones you're talking about because that was my first experience with them but before like the plastic um temporary ones i came across this i know exactly the structure you're talking about and i just used it out of curiosity i just had to have a go you i could have held on look. but i just wanted to give it a give it a red hot go take it for a spin and i think now on the 20 or 30 times that I've been lucky enough to go back to Amsterdam, I've made a point of going and using one of those. Yeah. Just, just because cause. it's so Amsterdam, it's so Dutch yeah. that I've never come across them anywhere else. No, me neither. And they're a great idea. They're a fantastic idea. Especially in a known party city like Amsterdam. For you're going to sure. get a lot of people who are needing the bathroom and maybe tempted to do the wrong thing and just do it you know, outdoors publicly, mm -hmm. which is never nice. The no. smell, the mess, you no. know. Um, we try to find people to, yeah, I if mean, you get caught, get in trouble, yeah. And I think a big thing in a lot of those countries is because they have pretty relaxed laws around drinking outside, it means that a lot of people are drinking outside, but there's not the appropriate amount of toilets and washroom facilities yeah. to cater to the drinking outside. Whereas in a country like Australia, where drinking is only allowed either in your own private home or in a bar. So I think the issue is there that. People go out to the parks and the streets and sit by the canals on a nice summer's day and drink and drink, but then there's no toilet in sight. No to go. And they had an issue with people urinating publicly. Publicly, It's so. quite a simple fix and, and quite an effective one, I would think. It like works. It. And when you get over the fact that people are walking two, three feet away from you, you're like, well, it's not my problem. No. It's theirs. And I mean, when you I'm go doing for the right a, thing. when you do a, if you do a, you know, outdoor wee anyway, there's people everywhere. Yeah, so it's, it's at least, at least it's a little bit more private legal. and <laughs> it's not going all over the tree or all over the wall and then causing mess and smell and all yeah, that sort exactly. of thing. Yeah, you know? exactly. And you can find that, you know, those spots, especially when you're walking around a city and you hit that one corner that's just got that dank smell. Obviously, that's the- You know. The, pu the pea corner, it's yeah, horrendous. Yeah. It's an yeah. awful smell. Often you can smell it before you even see it. Yeah. Like, I bet you there's a good little pea corner around here. And then, then there's a puddle there it. and you're like, it hasn't rained yeah. in six months. That's very <laughs> peculiar. <laughs> and I remember it being in Europe on a nice summer's day in, in different cities where you're allowed to drink outside and there's a big, beautiful park and there's a lot of people gathering in the afternoon and it's great because you're all drinking and having a picnic and stuff. But then yeah. when you need to go to the toilet, 
there's no public toilet in sight. It's the worst. And then you see other people who also need to go to the toilet, can't find the public toilet because there's no facilities, and they're finding the closest tree, the yeah. closest wall. And then all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, this actually ain't so nice because. And I, I think it turns into a spot, doesn't it? Like when you're like when you're in that park uh, sort of atmosphere, you can see people scurrying off to certain places, and there's obvious there's obvious places where you would go, mm. right? And everybody obviously has the same thought. And then you go there, and it's and it's grim. It becomes the spot. It's and, the spot, and it's bleak. And then you always see that poor person who maybe didn't know it was the spot, and oh, goes yeah. and sits in that sits area near. Or you see someone use a tree, and then twenty minutes later, someone comes and picnics oh, under that tree. Awful. And that's when you go. Mm, if we're going to allow drinking outside, there has to be the facilities. appropriate facilities sure. to match. Otherwise, this actually doesn't become so nice anymore. No, it's pretty gross when you yeah. think about it. So it's a double-edged sword it is. allowing the drinking outside. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely those uh, those Dutch Amsterdam outdoor toilets are definitely weird. Weird But at also first. wonderful. Weird at first, but uh, when you get used to it, uh, wonderful. Well done to the Dutch. Well done we to love the it. Dutch. Yeah, tip of the cap. Thumbs up. Yeah. Big tick on that one. What about, tell me your experience with another weird and wonderful toilet culture, uh, the old bum gun. Ah, uh, yes. I know this is a favorite of yours, Pete. The bum gun. <laughs> Found mostly in Asia. Tell us about your thoughts and experiences of the bum gun. The bum gun is a strange, coming from a Western background, your first experience First time you have to use a bum gun. It's a strange, strange time. But it makes more sense really when you think about it. It does. For the listeners, tell them exactly, describe to them exactly what we're talking about. Well, the bum gun is, uh, it's pretty much what it sounds like. It's a hose that uh, has like a trigger on it, one of those trigger hose styles that when you go to the toilet, when you're finished, you don't use paper, you, you get this hose and you give yourself a squirt and uh, clean yourself off that way. Um, and it's it's quite peculiar the first time you have to do it. Where did you find most of your bum guns in part of the world? India. Mm. A lot of bum guns in India. A lot right? of bum guns in India and Asia. In Asia. Well, I have experienced a few in Asia. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm the kind of person, to be fair, though, that uh, yeah, I always have some to- toilet paper with me. You Carry well, some TP with me. I agreed. I agreed. Emergency TP? Necessity. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So, how but, do you feel now about the bum gun? Are you are you uh, an an advocate for the bum gun? Not really. <laughs> not still not a fan of the bum gun. Not despite really. lots of experience. Yeah, I look. I'll use them because you know you have to. And uh, if you don't have any other choice, no, you're not going to just pull your pants up and walk away. That's disgusting. when in Rome. When in Rome, exactly. When in wherever. <laughs> when but, desperate. Yeah, I'll definitely use them because yeah, you have to. But it's just uh, it's just strange. It's very invasive i feel some of them are quite quite a lot of pressure behind them do they all have the same pressure or do you do you test the pressure beforehand to check the pressure i think you probably should there's a couple of times where i haven't and had a bit of a rude surprise so a public service announcement for those who travel to india asia anywhere where you find a bum gun pre-bum gun use give it a little test run definitely check the pressure pressure beforehand just give it a quick shot and uh it will definitely benefit you because some of them you need to be aware of the pressure that's about to hit you. You don't want a nasty surprise and or injury. No, yeah. And I guess based on the pressure, you're gauging the distance at which you would hold the yeah. bum gun. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. To manage then the pressure and prevent injury. Yeah, that's true. What would be your average distance to hold a bum <laughs> gun as a rule of thumb? Um, oh, that's a good question, actually. Uh, well, what do you reckon, like? 50, 60 centimetres? 50, 60 centimetres, yeah. Because yeah. foot- some of them are quite, even though like... Pretty powerful. A lot of these countries don't seem to have good water pressure, but the bum gun, that's where it... Maybe okay. that's why. All the, all the, all the, the, the whole country's <laughs> water pressure is safe for the bum gun. Maybe. Do they have different settings or is there one setting fits all? I've never come across different settings, to okay. be fair. Uh, it's, a, it's usually just like a standard sort of hose and... Maybe they need the Japanese to go in there and... Sort them out. Give a few more options. Yeah, maybe you could have like, you know, those... You know those attachments you get for your garden hose? For your garden hose, With like, yeah. you know, the multiple ones you get a like a- gentle sprinkle spray. Yeah, one's like a mist a, and one's yeah. a jet. The jet probably wouldn't be- You can get the three spray, yeah, two spray, I think one. there's one called soak as well. It's real <laughs> thick. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go into the times when you would need to use the soak, no, but- this is off topic uh, here, but- 
<laughs> the good old bum gun. Yeah. Another uh, weird and wonderful thing I've come across with toilets is is the teepee, the toilet paper. And in sort of Western culture, we're quite accustomed to putting the toilet paper in the toilet. Yeah. However, when you travel to other countries, certain countries, it is customary to put the TP not in the toilet, but in the bin. Yeah. There's always a, usually a bin nearby beside the toilet or in, in the washroom, in the stall, where you are uh, required, encouraged uh, to put the toilet paper. And I think for the first time that people come across that, it freaks him out a bit. It is qu- quite confusing. It is a little confronting mm. and confusing because, again, it's different to what you're used to. And I guess a mix of you think it's a bit gross and disgusting because yeah. you, you suddenly for the first time realize that there is a whole bin of dirty teepee sitting two foot away from right you. Right next to you. And that's what's the, the smell, that smell. Yeah, that, okay, I found, I found the source of the I've, smell. I've located the source. And the other thing is then for you to go and do it uh, kind of freaks you out a little bit because you're not used to it. And I guess it's a very maybe confronting visual thing, yeah, perhaps. it definitely you know? is. Um, I guess by putting it in the toilet, we're used to kind of you know, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, absolutely. Good riddance, bye-bye, and then it's gone. But uh, the style, the culture of putting it in the, in the bin uh, means it kind of is it around a bit more, um, I reminds think it's- you a bit more. Yeah, and I mean, the reason they do it is because their plumbing isn't up to scratch, as it were. It's the the pipes are small and they can't handle it. Therefore, they block a lot. Indeed. So that's why they do it. But it is, yeah, it makes you more aware. I think of <laughs> yeah what goes on in here, even though you're fully aware. But when you see it, like you said before, out of sight, out of mind, mm. right? It is just that that reminder. Yeah. Of Everybody everyone poops. who's been before you, <laughs> and and you're adding to it. For those who haven't experienced it yet. Heads up, certain countries. It takes a bit of getting used to. Like it does it's take just a bit of getting a, used to. Such a, a like reaction to one after you what? It's you, almost you uh, it something the, you do subconsciously. Yeah, invo- it's yeah. a habit, an involuntary habit. habit. But when you travel to and it, and it's surprising for a lot of people how many countries actually have this. So a lot, a lot of Central and South America. Yeah, I would say most. Some parts of Asia. Uh, some parts of the Mediterranean, Eastern Europe. Definitely. Uh, Greece is one that comes to mind. Yeah. I remember guiding groups of travelers around Greece a lot, and that was something we constantly had to inform them about or remind them of or console them over <laughs> yeah. because the, the shock and horror that they had to put their teepee in the bin, and we would remind them that it is actually of their – for their best interest, yeah, because it is. no one wants a blocked toilet. No, if you keep putting it in there, it will block. Yeah. Hot tip if Hot you tip. haven't experienced it. And for those who have experienced it, you know and you probably had a smile come to your face and remembered the first time that you experienced your first toilet paper in the bin, not in the toilet. I remember being in Central America. I was in Belize and I uh, went to use the toilet in my hostel there and – it had not been cleaned for quite some time and they were employing the bucket, the bin for the TP situation. And I reckon the toilet paper was stacked about twice as high as the actual toilet paper bin. Damn. And it was disgusting. <laughs> it was a grim reminder of the luck we have in the Western world with our toilets and flushing our toilet paper. <laughs> it was horrendous. Do you believe toilet paper is better? Or the washing with water is better because I think around the world, in terms of population, it is perhaps half half. I, I I sit in the toilet paper camp only because I think that's what I've grown up with. But when you think about it, you wash. You want to wash something. If you get dirty, you don't just wipe yourself with paper, do you? You wash yourself. So when you think about it, really, the wa- the bum gun or the or the bidet or whatever makes a lot more sense because. You're going to give yourself a good wash with some water to, to clean yourself up, not just kind of smudge it around with a bit of paper. This is true. This is true. When you think about other times in our lives that we try to clean things up, yeah. water is often... Everything. I mean, when you need a shower... You don't just wipe yourself down with some towels. Only the British do that, I think. Yeah. Well, you do it when you're, when you're traveling, when you're couple backpacking. A couple, couple of hand, baby wipes. Yeah, handy baby wipes. wipes are a must. They're a must for a cheeky baby wipe shower. Under you know, the arm here under and there. Under the arms. 
And then you're good to go. Downstairs and off you go. That's so that's a different that's a different kettle. That's of when fish. you're desperate. That's when you're desperate. But if you've got water, if you've got yeah, use it. Yeah, exactly right. Go and for the water treatment. It's got to be better for the environment too. Water. This is true. This is like, true. You've got to produce the toilet paper. You've got to cut down the trees to make it. And you've got to have the factories to produce them. You've got to wrap them in plastic to sell them, and then That's you flush true. them down the toilet into the ocean. So, yeah. when you think about it, the water is better. But so we should embrace some more I think water we should. into our toilet etiquette. I think we should into our toilet procedures. I mean, I'm a. I still use toilet paper, obviously, so I can't speak. But it makes it makes sense. It makes more sense. It really. does make sense. And I guess we kind of default back to what we're used to when yeah. we're in countries where toilet paper is the norm. Yeah. But then and when you go to a country that either uses the Japanese style or the bidet or the water hose or the bum gun, you just you just switch to that, and then that becomes the norm. Yeah, that and is. You're fine with it. And it doesn't take long, and you do get used to it. You do, get but once used to you, it. like you say, once you come back to what you're used to, you're, you just fall right back into that. The toilet habit paper's there, you grab it. Yeah. And if there's no bum gun, you can't use a bum gun. No. And you have to clean up. <laughs> you need to. Note you can't to, use nothing. That's just disgusting. note to self. Yeah. Always clean up. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Now you've traveled. You've been in India. I am yet to visit India. Love to. It's on the list. But I guess. Further down the sliding scale of number twos <laughs> is that in India, obviously some parts of India are quite poor and even toilet paper, paper or the access to water to use a bum gun can sometimes be scarce. Yeah. And so at the other end of the scale, the simple bucket of water and the left-hand technique yes. is – Employed. Employed when there's nothing else to do. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the procedure and the kind of uh, things you need to remember when you travel to places like India and what the left hand versus the right hand yeah, is well, used for and can, and can mean. The left, hand is, the left hand is pretty much primarily, primarily for cleaning, I believe, and, uh, and that's for the right hand is what you use for eating with. So... A lot of the times over there, you eat you eat with your hands. You don't have cutlery or anything. You eat with your hands. So to eat with your left hand is is a bit of a frown. It's a, it's poo pooed, as it were, because of the poo poo. And you don't want to get them confused. No, you do not want to mix up the left. I and think the right they hand. probably uh, understand that you know Western people travel might, and in fact, have toilet paper with them and stuff, but. You will definitely get a few strange looks if you're somewhere and you start eating with your left hand, you know. If you're eating like a whatever rotty with your left hand, holding the bread, you'll get some strange looks because it's, it's not how it's done. They will think that that's odd. That's they the, will freak out for a moment. <laughs> they will gasp for yeah, a moment. Definitely don't go for a handshake with your left hand because... That's the other thing that even if maybe you're not using your left hand for the cleaning, they are. Yeah. And so they will be very poignant about only using their right hand for specific things and keeping their left hand well away. So, for example, yeah, shaking hands, mm. in general, touching things, touching money and giving money to and from. It's a one, it's a one use hand, really. It's really just put aside for <laughs> that one use. Yeah. And then most, if not all other things, for your right hand and there are to be quite separate and isolated from each other. Yeah. Another little weird and wonderful thing, is in, well, I found it mostly in Central Europe, uh, in particular in the country of Austria, where I spent some time. And they have what we called, but I don't know the official name for it, we were calling it the display shelf <laughs> in the toilet bowl. I called it the inspection shelf. The inspection shelf. Yeah. So as the name suggests... There is not the conventional shape to the toilet bowl in Austria. It has this uh, modified shape where before the lower, smaller hole where the water is, there is a flat angle of the porcelain of, of the toilet bowl itself. And on this flat angled porcelain section is where most of your number two lands instead of into the hole, into the water, kind of out of sight. Instead, it is on this inspection shelf, this display shelf, for all to see 
And this is done on purpose. There is a point to this. And the idea is that perhaps not maybe so much in modern days, but back in the day, you wanted to have a good self-inspection, a good self-assessment and evaluation of your stool, of your number two, to check that you are passing good, healthy stools, that there are no signs of anything unhealthy, anything untoward, anything that you should be concerned about. It's perhaps something left to us as a legacy of the old world. (laughs) Of the old days. That kind of just hasn't been changed and they're used to it. But the first time you go then, the first time you come across a toilet with an inspection shelf. Very confusing. What was your reaction? What went through your mind? I I genuinely like had to stand back and really inspect the toilet itself. I was like, what the heck is this thing? Because the ones I used had like the, the the actual hole where it all disappeared was at the front. So the shelf, Indeed, the shelf was sort of towards the, the shelf back. is at the back, and then the holes at the front, and then obviously the water comes down and washes it all away. But uh, yeah, that it was it. I was staying at a friend's house, a friend of a friend sort of thing. They were putting us up for a few nights, and uh, I had to go and ask her what the heck is wrong with the toilet. You need some explanation. Yeah, this you want to check and make sure you were doing it right. Were you even in the right room? Yeah, is this room reserved is, for something? Is this else? something else? Like because it it looked like a toilet had flushing buttons but there was something funky going on in the bowl there it was quite peculiar it wasn't just quite right no something something pricked your ear and said Hang yeah on a, a little red flag it's very strange just want to check on this and make sure i'm doing it properly and i'm not too fond of them to be honest because not a fan well they you know when it goes when when you go and it goes in the water i feel like it masks the scent a little bit Good but point. when there's the inspection shelf, there's there's a touch, there's a little bit of water in there, but there's not enough. And a lot of it is it, free to air. Yeah, to loom and waft, and it really, it really to rise comes out the smell. Like the the water really says something for how well it holds the smell. That is a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. I do remember them well after living a couple of winter seasons in Austria. We become very used to them, and we used to get a good kick and a good laugh out of people coming and visiting and and using it and discovering it and their shock and horror at the first time (laughs) and, again, wondering if they (laughs) are, in fact, doing it properly or even in the right room. And we went to the point where on the back of the toilet door we posted a a graph, a poster, (laughs) with diagrams and explanations of the different uh, stools that oh, yeah. you may expect and what they mean. Your health issues. And Your if health there is issues. Any. If you have this type of stool, stool A, this means this, this, and this. Too much fiber. Healthy, too much fiber, a little dehydrated, ah. a bad vindaloo the night before. <laughs> too much alcohol. <laughs> too much alcohol. And so we kind of embraced it yeah. and, and had some to. fun with it. Yeah. I remember when I was tour guiding around Europe and we'd go to Austria and I'd give a little spiel, a little talk, tell him all about Austrian history and culture and – one of the things I used to love informing them about were the inspection toilets. <laughs> and the one thing we used to encourage people to do was before they took their number two was to make a raft <laughs> because there's nothing worse because they were prone to getting dirty. They were prone yeah, to, makes- you know, mess and skids and marks being left behind. Of course. And to prevent that, we would encourage people to lay a little raft Ah. before doing their business um, and put your passengers in the raft, (laughs) inspect if you need to. Keep all arms and legs inside the vehicle. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, And then when you're done your business and when you're done your inspection, if you wish, uh, flush and send your raft on down the rapids. You need and to you need to check, don't you, with those. That's the thing with those toilets is you need to have a good look afterwards to make sure it's all clear. When in Rome, again, uh, <laughs> have a little inspect, if you wish. Lay a raft. Definitely. And enjoy the cultural experience. <laughs> have a good sniff as well. <laughs> enjoy the smells, the sights, the sounds. And then it's off down the, the rapids you go. That's what travelling's all about, the sights, the sounds, the smells, you know. Beautiful. Now, moving to the far end of the scale, we've gone from best to the middle ground of the weird and wonderful. Yes. And number twos always have to end up at the very bottom. Yeah. And the very bottom of toilet experiences, I think we both concur, have been experiences with toilets in China. China, 
is there. I have another experience in Egypt. Oh, tell us about your Egypt experience. Um, well, I was on a I was on a bus going out to uh, Abu Simbel, and I don't know if you've been there. I have. Yep. It's quite in the middle of nowhere, and uh, our bus stopped at this. I don't know. I guess it was the Egyptian equivalent of like a truck stop, but it was in the middle of the desert, and we stopped there for a toilet break for the bus, and I think that is probably the worst toilet I've ever been in in my life to the sense that it was so busy and there was actually probably about uh, in the in the males there was probably about 10 mil to 15 mil of just water in the whole bathroom not just in the in the stalls or anything just the whole bathroom was across the floor across the floor the entire floor yeah the i'm not sure if it, i don't know what kind of water it was I ended up not don't going. Don't ask questions. You no, don't I didn't go in there. I ended up just going out in the desert. I just went into the dunes and had a wee. But the smell coming from this toilet was horrendous and the, and the water level. And then the, my partner at the time I was traveling with, she said that the females were no different. It was, it was horrendous. The smell, man, I can't even begin to tell you how bad it smelled and it's not like it was flooding due to recent rain no you're in the desert it was the desert it was flooding due to terrible terrible plumbing and i didn't i took about two steps in and realized how deep the water was and i was like yeah nah this is you didn't feel like going swimming that day (laughs) it was good eh? i didn't bring your swim i didn't actually take my board shorts nah you know, if I'd had, maybe it would have been a different story. But swimming was not scurried. on the itinerary that day. It wasn't. It wasn't part of my uh, part of my schedule in the desert. So I scurried off over a dune and took a quick dune wee. I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I mean, everyone knows those desert sand dunes need all the moisture they can they get. They do. I so thought I was helping. Environmentally friendly there, <laughs> I'd say. No, exactly. Chalk that one up. But uh, um, yes. I do know that uh, we've both had some experiences in China. Yeah. Some experiences we'd rather forget, yeah. yet we keep reciting the stories <laughs> and we will do again here one here more gonna, time. Here we go again. So for those that don't know, China, amazing country to visit. Beautiful. Don't let the current situation, media, whatever, put you off going to China. Fantastic place to visit. I've been three times myself. Yeah. But you do need to be aware that the toilets there are a little different. Are Mainly a little in the South though, isn't it? I, I, well, me personally, I spent most of my time in the south, mm-hmm. and the further north I got, they seemed to get a bit better. Or maybe that was just the places I was going. Perhaps I think I was so scarred that <laughs> in an effort to try and forget some of the experiences, I didn't really plot it on a map. Yeah, okay, and fair enough. Necessarily write it in my diary you and don't where plot I your was. Toilet usage. I didn't uh, that trip, okay. no, because well. I felt like most of the toilet experiences were going to be ones that I'd rather forget yeah. than, than oh, they plot were. on a map. They were. Or put in my diary. So, and when you get to China, at least for me, it was thankfully a semi gentle progression into the worst of the worst. Yeah. I didn't have a harsh hit of the worst. At first, you go there and you realize that a lot of them are just holes in the ground. Yeah. And you're like, okay, you go into a stall, four walls, a door that locks, a stall, uh, and it's just a hole in the ground. Uh, two spots to place your feet. You have a little bit of confusion. You kind of weigh it up, do a quick bit of geometry, use a bit of Pythagoras theorem, <laughs> make sure your aim and your angles are all good. Yep. You wonder which way you're supposed to face, the wall or the door. At the end, it doesn't really matter. You try to make sure you don't get it everywhere and all over your feet and shoes, and generally you get by okay. And I thought, oh, that's not too bad. That was the first experience. And then the next sort of toilet experience was the same, a little bit rougher, a little bit dirtier, but this time it was just a three-walled stool, no door. And Mm. I walked in and I thought the one that I got just happened to be a bad choice. I got unlucky with no door. Mm. And then I realized they all have no doors. Yeah. I thought, it's a bit strange, not used to that, but hey, everyone's doing it. Um, I need to go. What else can you do? And then I think the third experience, which was something I really didn't expect, was when you go in and the entire bathroom has no stools whatsoever, but many pissoirs. 
And so no back wall, no side walls, no door. It's open slather, free for all. You can see what everybody's doing. You just line up next to someone and away you go. One or two as well, isn't it? One or two. It's crazy. One or two. You're two, three foot away from someone, no walls between, no doors. Um, you're just letting rip out in the open yeah. with your buddies 10 or 20 deep. Um, it's quite the experience. That took some getting used to. <laughs> It took some getting used to. And it's at that point that you think, I think I've seen it all now. I've experienced probably the lower end of toilets. Welcome to China. <laughs> and But no, <laughs> that is not as far as it goes. Those were still relatively clean, not too smelly, still had running water. You ah. still flush and it has a bit of running water. And then I was on a bus ride. A cross-country bus ride, it was a good maybe seven-hour bus ride, so it stopped three or four times for snacks and toilet break. Pretty civil, pretty normal, until we got to this one little snack shop stop with a little toilet outhouse thing going on. It was on a bit of a mountain road, so you know, it wasn't really near any populations or near any major towns. But I remember going into what looked like a relatively normal toilet building, and in the men's, all I could find was a trough, a piss trough. And thankfully, I only need to go number one to take a leak at the time. But I took my leak and I thought it was just strange that there was only a stand-up trough or what I assumed to be a stand-up trough for number ones. And didn't really think much of it otherwise because I didn't need to do a number two until a gentleman pulled up next to me instead of standing up to do a number one like I was, decided to about face 180 degrees, drop his dax and take a squat position two feet next to me <laughs> and do his number two into the same trough where I was doing number one. Yeah. You can imagine my surprise. I had not been warned about this. I was not aware of this, had not experienced this before. And at this point, he was eye level to little Alan and I was... <laughs> watching him reverse face do his business how come he was looking at you uh i guess they don't see too many westerners out there yeah, I know, right? um, at least know? turn around come on dude <laughs> come on bro <laughs> like. and he was eye high to my little fella and the whole time whilst trying to manage my shock and surprise i was trying to make sure that my number one wasn't oh, was splashing <laughs> all over his backside <laughs> Because he was so close to me and reversed up, dax around his ankles in the little squat position. Uh, there were so many emotions and senses and physical reactions yeah. going on. Uh, I managed to get out of there alive. Thankfully, it all is a bit of a blur, mm. something that I've tried to put out of my memory for a long time now. <laughs> but I remember at the end of it all, my number one business, his number two business, sitting all in this same trough and then realizing that there was no running water. There was nowhere to actually flush the toilet. And I wondered how long it sits there for. How do they clean it? Because when I went in, it wasn't filled up with it's too dry. much, you know. And then as we were pulling out from the stop on the bus, I saw the little old lady who runs the shop go in there with a big, what looked like an industrial size, like fire hose <laughs> and just blast the entire place down. Yeah. And I got my answer. I figured yeah. out how they clean it at the end of each bus when they come through. But that for me was probably the lowest the of lows. I had a similar one, same same sort of thing in China as well. Yeah. This, the, this one actually had it had like little walls, little little sectioned off cubicles. But when I say walls, the walls probably came up just just above my crotch, sort of thing. So you were standing to you know to I was standing to wee in the in the in the in the trough, and then you could just see the guy there having a poo. <laughs> just and obviously being being a Westerner, a six foot five white dude in the middle of rural China, they 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 look at you right. They're so, very interested yeah, in every which, movement fair you enough, do, you know, and, including your bowel movements, yeah, so you including just, your bladder movements. You just kind of walk in there and and then the, the people coming in, the next people coming in, they're just staring at you like, you know, hey, man, how you going? Like, can we can we do this outside? Like, I'm happy to talk to you, but maybe not just right now. I'm a little <laughs> bit occupied at the moment. Same thing, no water or anything in it. And then afterwards, there was that poor lady who had to go in there with a hose and just hose out all just the everyone's business. Have you ever had an experience where there are uh, bars on the sides of the toilets? Uh, yeah. I can't remember 
where this was. And I don't know. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this the other day, and it was like bars on the on the side of the toilet. So like either side, one either side, one either side on the actual bowl. And on it, the actual bowl, it was like attached to the bowl. It was like handles to hold on. If, At what height? Same height as the toilet seat, roughly? Uh, no, about? a bit below the toilet seat. Okay. It was a real perfect, like, arm's length so you could just hold on and if you had, like, a real stubborn one. It was for grip. I think so. You think it was for grip? I don't know. I don't, what else would it be for? I don't know. Like, in, maybe for installing it, but that seems a bit they elaborate. You just forgot to remove it afterwards. <laughs> I don't know. It <laughs> seems a bit elaborate for installing a toilet. The only conclusion I could come to was that it was for grips when you're having... A, a real stubborn a one. A stubborn one. <laughs> it reminds me of the scene in Austin Powers, mm. the who does, oh, yeah. who does number <laughs> yeah. two work for. That's when you needed those grips. That's exactly what they're for. And the guy in the store next to him is like, oh, buddy, you got, you got <laughs> a real that, tough one there. Tell that turd who's bus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell that turd. How about a customary flush over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to round it out in terms of uh, – Good toilet quotes from movies. Mm. One of the classics from Crocodile Dundee. Oh, yeah. Where he's in New York. He's come Crocodile from Dundee 2, I believe. Crocodile Dundee 2. Yeah. Where he goes and visits New York. And he's in the nice plush apartment, a uh, hotel the suite. Or something like that. And he goes into the bathroom and he's wondering why there are what he perceives as Two toilets. I think he. Uh, I think the. I think he says some nitwits put two dunnies in here, and he's trying to like wonder. He's looking at it. He's thinking about like mounting it towards the wall. And then he puts his foot up I mean, to it, thinking is it's a, a point, shoe wash yeah. or something. And he and then he turns the tap on, and the spray gets bigger and bigger. It's shooting <laughs> yeah. across the bathroom. Yeah. And then I think she says, "You'll figure it out." Yeah. And she leaves, and then he figures it out and yells from the high-rise hotel down to her as she's getting in the taxi and says, uh, he whistles, he yeah, whistles at her. And she looks up and he says, it's for washing your backside, right? <laughs> yeah. And she gives him a thumbs gives him up. Gives him a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering we've said washing your backside, yeah. let's round it out there. Pete, thanks for joining us as always. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Do our best. We'd like to thank everybody for listening in. Hope this wasn't too gross. We hope we didn't scare too many people off. Seeing as though it's only episode two, please come back for number three. We had to... What's number three? Number three, I think number three, we may talk about the age-old decision of top bunk versus bottom bunk Ooh. when staying in a shared hostel environment. style environment. Yeah. So we'd like to thank everybody for listening in. We'd like to encourage everybody to go and listen to episode number three. Mm -hmm. And whatever media player you're listening to this on, whether it's Apple iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, we want you to go and click follow or subscribe so that you can become a regular listener. We want to thank anyone who is uh, maybe listening, our hardcore super fans who listen to number one and number two. Pete's mum. Thanks, mum. Peace out. Enjoy. Enjoy your number twos. <laughs> See you next time. See ya. <laughs>A big thank you goes out to our good friend Dave Petrie of Off The Wall Sounds, who has been a huge help and Dave kindly created our theme tune as well as worked on the sound design and mixing of this episode. You can find Dave at his website offworldsounds.com and on the gram at offworldsounds. Thanks, Dave.